Did you know this movie's actually a prequel? I know. So, to so what movie? You know what movie this is a prequel to? I'm terrified. You say 993? Is that what you're about to say? No, I'm appalled. I was going to say the Borat franchise. Oh, well, fair. That's, <laughs> that's not much better. Not much better. Not much better than that. This is a little better. You're a terrible movie. <laughs> sure, but that's beside the point. Anyway, welcome to everyone watching at home. That was a reference to Borat's subsequent movie film when Rudy Giuliani tried to take his pants off. Anyway, he's sort of a character in this movie, but not really. Welcome to filmography. That's David <laughs> Coho. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> what? You're that's, still not gonna that's, Caleb, that's Caleb Boatman. Oh my god. I'm sorry. You're throwing me off with your weird fucking... You're not even you tonight. You're just like, hi, I'm edgy Caleb Boatman. I did a lot of blow before we started the show. Like, I don't know what you're doing. I'm very wired. This is this is a very tough week for me school wise. So I'm very That's wired. How the cookie crumbles. Or how it crumbles, cookie wise. That's a quote from the apartment. Speaking of the apartment, Aaron Sorkin probably lives in one. Maybe at some point in his life. Probably not. Probably not. If he does, it's a penthouse at this point. I mean, at some point he lived in a apart in an apartment. That's that's fair. I'm not gonna make anyway. That. Anyway. anyway. Anyway, so uh, it's been a while since we talked about Aaron Sorkin. Uh, and in real life, in real time, it had been a while since Aaron Sorkin had written a film. <laughs> so should we cover what he was doing in the, like, what is it, 12 years that he didn't write a movie? I don't I don't want to alienate people with too much of a West Wing conversation. because We won't, I know we won't go too much of the West Wing. Because the West, here's the thing, the West Wing, pro, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, and maybe we can save it a little bit for the next episode, but the West Wing arguably is the best thing Sorkin has ever done. Arguably his we will have the West that Wing discussion is, on the But we will punt that discussion to the next episode. But the West Wing is one of the greatest television shows of all time. But that's not exclusively what the man did. Uh so uh in 1997 uh he finished his contract out with Castle Rock Entertainment at the end of his time writing with Castle Rock Entertainment post writing the American president uh, he was a script doctor for a lot of the 90s. Uh, he wrote quips for Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage in 1996's The Rock. Uh, he did a rewrite on a 1997 film called Excess Baggage and rewrote Will Smith's part in Enemy of the State. He also came about inches away from a fourth screenplay credit of his career when he did a massive page one rewrite on a film that won, or no, it was not won, but was nominated for Best Original Screenplay, Bullworth. Uh, he rewrote Warren Beatty's Bullworth from page one. Um, so, Which is also a movie that features Will Joshua Molina, Will Bailey, and Oliver Platt, Oliver Babish from the West Wing, where they do cocaine in a bathroom. And that is part of my West Wing fan fiction. So anyway. additionally, so additionally he, he stayed on. Warren Beatty was so impressed. Beatty hired him to write a couple other scripts, one of which was a rewrite of a script that he had called Ocean of Storms, which never went into production. Beatty is very famous for paying out of pocket on his projects. He never paid Sorkin for it, and Sorkin sued him uh, for never being paid to write that film. Uh, that was actually the reason why he decided to go exclusively into television, was Warren Beatty being an asshole. Uh, so he wrote his first television series called Sports Night, uh, which was uh, written, which was conceived during the writing of the American president when he would work late and watch ESPN uh, for replays of Sports Center. Uh, Disney actually is the ones who bought Sports Night and aired that on ABC. Uh, the first season being infamous for a laugh track that went away that Sorkin hated. It was the first time he worked in TV. It's not necessarily a show that like he's very proud of and everyone else is very proud of, but very short-lived and had a lot of issues at the start uh, creatively. And at the same time, he's very, it is also very notable that while he was working on the second season of Sports Night, he worked on the first season of The West Wing, which is why both seasons of television are very, very much focused on two individuals, uh, Aaron Sorkin and Tommy Schlamy, who helped run both uh, of those seasons of TV. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's his major collaborator. The West Wing, we can do a whole podcast on, so we won't get too in-depth. Sorkin won uh, many Emmys uh, for the West Wing for writing. Um, he has uh, The show itself got nine primetime Emmys for its first season, uh, which is a record holder for most Emmys won by a series in a single season. Um, 
he left that Perception show. He left that. past that this season. I stand by it. I don't know, but we'll see. Uh, it would need to win nine Emmys in one season, so that's that would result in a lot of ties necessary. It can happen. It can happen. I don't Everyone know. Unless, that cast wins wins an Emmy, I'd be happy. I don't. I don't know if that's possible. Anyway, um, I'll make it I, happen. I don't like every Emmy winner with a baseball bat and a sock full of nickels. So after the fourth season, Sorkin and Shalami leave the West Wing due to creative issues, and also because. Pretty infamously at this point in time, Aaron Sorkin is busted for cocaine, uh, which is a major uh, issue for him. Uh, he's uh, he's had a lot of issues with drugs in his personal life. Uh, it happens before, and then the last bust happens uh, during the production of the fourth season of The West Wing after he had gotten clean. Uh, it was a relapse, and that was part of it, was contrib a contribution of uh, the cocaine uh, and his own decision to leave. Uh, so those two and, and creative issues with the studio – meant that Shlami and Sorkin walked at the end of the fourth season, which led to the infamous fifth season, and then they recover with season six and seven a little bit, but it's never quite as good as the first four. Um, in 2005, he goes back to theater, and he uh, rewrites A Few Good Men for the West End, um, and Rob Lowe stars in the leading role, um, which is pretty cool. And then he makes a new TV show called Studio 7 on the Sunset Strip, with him and Shlami. Uh, and then, no, no, when it started, the pilot was called Studio 7 on the Sunset Strip. Uh, but, fun fact, uh, when CBS bought it, uh, they changed it to Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip because there's actually a Studio 7, and it would have gotten too confusing. Uh, so Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip uh, is the renamed version of it. Uh, after a two-month hiatus due to writers and low ratings, uh, it was canceled after one season. Uh, which Sorkin says is still the greatest disappointment of his television career because he really likes that show, and also because it debuted on the same season as 30 Rock, and you had two competing shows with the same idea. Yeah, no, I think that's... I Not to get too bogged down into a Studio 60 discussion, Another but I think it's actually kind of interesting to look at like the fact that it was Studio 60 and 30 Rock, and everyone at the time thought that Studio 60 was going to be this massive show... And 30 Rock was going to be the blip. They thought Studio 60 was going to be the prestige and 30 Rock would be the illusionist. Yeah. The core problem at Studio 60, and I enjoy the show, the core problem with Studio 60 is that 30 Rock was a funny show about a sketch comedy show. Studio 60 was a serious show about a sketch comedy show. And most of America would rather watch the funny show when it's about a sketch comedy show. Third Rock is also brilliant. There's also, uh, there's also the big issue that the two, or at least two of the major leads of 30 Rock are Alec Baldwin and Tina Fey, who are very bankable names. And the two stars of Studio 60 are a post-friends Matthew Perry and a post-friends Bradley Whitford, who are still very bankable names in television at the time, but it's not Tina Fey and Alec Baldwin. So that's, you know, a big issue. Wait, Though sorry, I think Bradley, yeah, I think I think Bradley Whitford and Matthew Perry are great. Tina Fey was not the most bankable name in 2000. Sure. And really, neither was... And in yeah. 2006, Alec Baldwin yeah. was not uh, really... He was, Alec Baldwin was, is... Uh, Alec Baldwin that is was in the midst of, of like, the first Alec Baldwin controversy. And everyone okay, hated but him. But Three Rock is what gave him the comeback. He's fresh off the Oscar nomination when he makes Three he's Rock. There's three like a two separated from the Oscar nom. And he has all that Oscar controversy nomination. in between. Still, but Tina Fey has written Mean Girls and has been like the the freaking like he, her and Amy Poehler are like the the biggest uh, besides Will Ferrell the biggest breakouts from that era of SNL. It's those three are the stars of SNL at that time. So even though she's maybe the third biggest star on SNL, it's still in the like most insanely stacked era of SNL ever. So Tina I'm Fey is still like Shannon was big enough that she got her own. Show I'm saying that Tina Fey has written Mean Girls, and that's a blank check for life at that point. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> then, then Aaron Sorkin confirms that he is writing a spec script about Philo Farnsworth uh, called the Farnsworth Invention. Um, it was then uh, taken as a sorry a completed screenplay to New Line Cinema with Tommy Shlomi hired to direct. Uh, so they were going to make a film together, Shlomi directing. And Sorkin writing about the patent battle between Sarnsworth and David Sarnoff for the technology that allowed the first television transmissions in the United States. Um, he was a, uh, he was uh, contacted by the Abbey Theater Dublin to rewrite it into a play. 
a commission that he accepted because no film studio uh, after New Line dropped it was interested. Uh, so he turns it into a play. Uh, he uh, is set to put it on at the Hall La Hala Playhouse in 2007 as a workshop. Um, and then in uh, 2006, it turns out the Abbey Theater quit involvement in the play. La Hala carried on. And the producer of that play, the person who saves the Farnsworth Dimension, is Steven Spielberg, who then produces the play himself uh, because he thinks it's really good. So Spielberg essentially comes in. And because of this, they have a relationship that we'll come back to in a couple episodes. Uh, but Steven Spielberg uh, really loves Aaron Sorkin and basically helps him come back with that. The Farms of the Mention opens in 2007, closes in the beginning of 2008, so it's not a very successful uh, play. And then because of that in 2007, he gets a call from Universal uh, based on Spielberg's recommendation uh, about adapting George Cryle's nonfiction book, Charlie Wilson's War, for Tom Hanks' production company, Playtone. Uh, and that is where we pick up today. Before we start talking about the movie, do you know why Tom Hanks' production company is called Playtone? I do not. That is a reference to the film That Thing You Do. Ah, that is the name of the record company in That Thing You Do. Well, look at him go. He the reach of the pat on the back go for Tom Hanks. Uh, so, uh, the film's actual production is not very interesting. They get Mike Nichols, and it's pretty smooth sailing in terms of making the movie. All the interesting stuff happens after it comes up. So I think we should talk about the movie and then talk about all the stuff that happened due to its release. Um, I actually so, don't know this, so this is oh, we'll, be... we'll save it. So if you're interested in why Charlie Wilson's War is the most controversial film of the late 2000s, uh, stick around. Because I don't re I didn't realize this movie was that controversial until I looked all this shit up. Uh, but yeah, Charlie Wilson's War. It's fine. I, I, yeah, I mean, let's just jump into talking about the movie before we talk about yeah. general. But, uh, so, um, movie opens w with like a ceremony type thing of Charlie Wilson receiving an award. So we kind of know where things go before uh, we actually get there, which is fine. But then this image, like I feel like this was an image just put purely to separate the character of Charlie Wilson from Tom Hanks. Which is Charlie Wilson doing cocaine in a hot tub, or not doing cocaine, but in a hot tub with cocaine and topless women. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I it's, definitely, it's definitely a movie where I think the two of us can agree. Tom Hanks, great actor. Tom Hanks, not the problem with the movie. But Tom Hanks also, maybe not the right person for this part. Because it's kind of weird for the image he has curated at this point in his career, in the early 2000s to now. Being a father figure in most of the things he's done. He's the dad in Road to Perdition. He's like a father figure in Catch Me If You Can. Uh, a lot of, and in the terminal, he's a very happy, like he's struggling, but he's like a likable guy. Tom Hanks at this point has solidified himself as America's dad. So then into 2007 for him to be like, fuck that. I'm going to do blow off a stripper's ass in an Aaron Sorkin movie is very weird choice for him to make. So I don't know. I don't know if he's wrong for it, but I think it's a weird choice. Here's the thing. I, I don't think that actors should be pigeonholed into what they're good at. I think some of the greatest performances of all time come from actors completely going outside of what we expect from them. I'm and sure. but typically, I have a problem with Tom Hanks doing it because I think typically when Tom Hanks does go outside that realm, my biggest problem with it, this is the most recent A Man Called Otto and also You've Got Mail, which I think both are movies where Hanks has to play like the likable jerk. And even then, not really like, well, you're just kind of supposed to play a jerk who then gets redeemed at the end. In both cases, I think you are kneecapping the thing that Hanks has best, which is his charisma. That is like his best asset. True. And the fact that he's so charismatic. I think this movie, while clearly separating him from the wholesome Tom Hanks image, I actually think still utilizes the fact that Tom Hanks is so charismatic and you buy that this is this is the senator who has the most favors from everybody and pretty much everybody likes him. So I would raise you. I think you can get better people at this point in time to do that. I think Brad Pitt would be better in this part than Tom Hanks. I think you can get people who are super – Brad Pitt would be better at this. Very charismatic, but you can buy that he's doing a bit of unsavory things. That he might be a little self-absorbed a little bit. I don't buy Tom Hanks as self-absorbed. I don't buy Tom Hanks as selfish whatsoever. So when he's in this, you're like, oh, this guy's going to go on some path where he does some noble thing, and then he did it. But it's like I just don't buy Tom Hanks in this part where it's like the charisma, sure. 
But when it's the I'm at crazy parties partying it up like I'm Warren Beatty in the 70s, I just don't I don't believe it. I just don't think Tom Hanks does that well. Whereas like a Brad Pitt or even a Tom Cruise would have been better at the part. I'll give you Tom Cruise. I think Tom Cruise is too young. I my issue with Brad Pitt. I mean, this guy's supposed to be a little older. My issue with Brad Pitt is this was like the era when Brad Pitt was like very boring. This is like the most boring. Right the reading is not boring. Okay, no, but that's a year later. I'm I'm talking okay, about Jesse your James battle. is not boring. Jesse James is the same year, and that's not boring from him. Oh, okay, maybe the it's Ocean's, boring. The, the Ocean's movie, movie the Ocean's movie, not boring fun. from either. He yeah. doesn't start having fun until 08, 09. He was not having. He was very concerned with his movie star image. I don't agree because he, he has care. Like around this time, he's filming Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and he's filming Burn After Reading, and he's also like just on the Oceans movies, where he's kind of, like, by Oceans 12 and 13, subverting the role that he sets up as Rusty Ryan in the first one. And, like, the Jesse James is not a movie star role, so I think he's concerned with getting out of the Mr. and Mrs. Smith version of himself, and I think he would have absolutely stepped up to this plate and hit a home run. I think Brad Pitt is better for this part than Tom Hanks in every conceivable role. I, I just don't think I agree. George Clooney would actually be super interesting. In that I'll give you. That'll get. I, I, I'm a see. Here's the thing. I'm a huge George Clooney. Clooney. So I think actually, that's, no. I think that's the issue. And Clooney and Pitt both seem too cool. They just. I mean, but I guess you, if you get a Clooney, it goes a little bit more into the old brother or art thou line. I guess that's fine. He can. Like I think. I think. I think. Right now, right, especially right now in his this character, career, though, I don't know. I think you can. I think it's a different movie, and I think the movie's better with a. I think that's the issue. Is Charlie Wilson fucking blows as a character in the script? I think he's a bad character. So I, I think the way you can make, I think you can make Charlie Wilson more interesting with a better performance. Like I think the paper, the personal paper is not that interesting. The performance makes him interesting. And while Tom Hanks isn't the problem, I think you could do better than Tom Hanks with George Clooney to um, I, Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, any of those. I things. just fundamentally disagree that. Charlie Wilson, the character, or the performance is the problem with this movie. I think there are. I don't, I don't think. I don't think Hanks is the problem. I just think Hanks can be improved upon. Fair. I think the. I think the problem with this movie lies in the fact that I don't think Mike Nichols like is making the movie that the script calls for. I feel like there's a disconnect between the director and the screenplay. You know? Okay, this is actually gonna be funny. You know who I actually think could have killed this role? Oh. And it's funny. Because I Maybe have the exact opposite. Tim Robbins. Oh, I, actually, I actually think Tim Robbins, you get like the player style, like kid doing a similar I actually thing. completely agree. I actually completely agree. Tim Robbins would have hit this out of the home run park, and it would have been a great final nomination. Like, thank you, Tim and Robbins. You, like, final. You could have argued, oh, well, they wouldn't want to bank. Tim Robbins is in his bank. Well, you've got Julia Roberts in there. You don't need. Like, uh, you have a young, you have a young Amy Adams who's like clearly like popping at this point. Yeah, she wasn't bankable yet because I don't think Enchanted. Okay, Encha out. Enchanted is Enchanted's the same year, so it's like I mean, you yeah, have it had, I don't know if it had come out yet by the time or when they were making it. It certainly hadn't come out. So I mean, fair. I, I mean, Enchanted had come out by six months at the point of this coming out, so Enchanted was out. Fair. Um, but like I again, Amy Adams bankable. Philip Seymour Hoffman is, like, a prestigious, like, you can, like, not necessarily make the movie Philip Seymour Hoffman stars, but you have credibility with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Like, Amy Adams wasn't even on the posters. That's why I'm saying that. I mean, she's on, she's on one of the posters. Fair. She's not on, like, the main one. The main one just has Hanks, Roberts, and I don't see any posters that have Adams on them. The one that I have on Letterbox is uh, is the exact same image of Hanks and Roberts, and then where Philip Seymour Hoffman is, it's Amy Adams. It's the exact same there. poster. No, um, I I can't and, find that anywhere on the front page of Google, but valid. But like Amy Adams is like Amy Adams, so it's like whatever. But like I think the cast is bankable enough. You have like Ned Beatty still in here. Emily Blunt is on the rise. Like again, it's one of those where it's like you have a good enough cast. It's Aaron Sorkin's comeback, and this isn't a movie that you need a movie star to sell necessarily, because at this point, movie stars aren't entirely selling their movies. They it's, are definitely. It's, it's, it's three the last before bit. the terminal makes two hundred million dollars off yes, of it. Yes, but three Tom Hanks in an airport and three and Steven Spielberg directing. You have to forget. You have to remember Steven Spielberg is like still I, a I major think factor Hanks in making sold that movie more than Spielberg did. Sure. I. I I still think that at this point, like, okay, if that's the case, then why does the Curious Case of Benjamin Button next year make a billion dollars off the back of Brad Pitt 
who is like one of the biggest movie stars in the world. Why is Burn After Reading a Why is Burn After Reading make money? Why is Burn After Reading a box office failure with George Clooney and for, and fucking Brad Pitt? Because the with that's John a weird movie that mainstream audiences would. What not I, well, what I'm saying is the movie star selling movies is dying by the time 2007 is out. I don't think Tom Hanks is selling this movie the way you think it is. Hold on, I I completely did. Let's look at the, this movie. This movie, okay. To be spoiler alert, this movie barely makes its money back. To be clear, this it's movie, a, sure, I'm talking, but I'm saying in when three years prior, the Terminal makes that much money. I you can't say that just off the again. Movie. Steven Spielberg is a major factor in that. Steven Spielberg is a major factor in that. Whether you agree with me or not, the man has never made a box office failure until the Fablemans, which isn't even a failure. I mean, the BFG like, was a little... I was the a, BFG still made, like, the top 12 highest-grossing movies of the damn year, and no one liked it. That is not true. The BFG that was a big-time... Yes. Absolute lie. The, B, the, BFG cool. made, the BFG made some money, which is why... That is a bold-faced lie. It's not. The BFG made some money. The BFG the box, is not in the top 20... The top sure. 50 highest-grossing movies. Fair enough, then. But, like, here's the thing. Every single movie he's made has made money. Seven. I'll give you that. You said it every was single, Every single well. movie Steven Spielberg has ever made has, especially oh, when you look at the budget next to it, made a significant amount of money back on its budget. Lincoln was a major fucking hit. And that's a movie that's like, what the fuck? Why would Lincoln be a hit? And that's not on Daniel Day-Lewis. That's on Steven fucking Spielberg. Sure, but Hanks is a much more bankable star than D.D. I'm not saying he's not, but I'm just saying in general, the terminal being Hanks and Spielberg is the reason that makes money. If it's just Hanks, I don't think it makes as much money. Because you need to have the Spielberg factor as well. Anyway, Charlie Wilson's War, Tom Hanks doing blow off a stripper's ass. What the fuck is this first image of this movie? I mean, that's not the first image, but that's the... It's, it's essentially the first time we really know who this guy is. The first image is him winning a medal. Like, that's the juxtaposition. He's getting an award. Next scene, he's, like, flashback at the Playboy Manor, essentially, of Washington, D.C. It's like, what is happening? This is who we're giving a medal to. And so then then we get the, the you know, your Borat Sums Good Movie Film moment. <laughs> your your connection. So I, I want to go back a second, because I want to talk about this moment where I actually thought there was something very funny, very meta about the hot tub interaction. Because do you remember what the oh, guy... Yes. The guy's talking about uh, fucking uh, the... I can't remember the specifics, but he's writing, right? Well, am I, or am I he's watching a TV show <laughs> yeah. that is set in Washington, D.C. Oh, and yeah, okay. There needs to be a TV show set in Washington, D.C. Nobody's done that before. It's and Sorkin's, it's little, it's Sorkin's like, little meta wink at himself, yeah. Yeah, which, like, I mean, especially if you like think it. about the fact that Sarkin was busted for coke, it kind of makes sense that this guy basically just our Sarkin analog. Anyway. A little Sarkin insert, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, we move forward a little bit. Yeah, we find out that Hanks is being... I don't think we find that out until a little bit later, that Hanks is being... Here's, here's the issue with Charlie Wilson's work. This movie is a little too long. And has a little bit too much of scenes where it's like, this doesn't do anything. It's a little bit of like a bland, like it repeats itself a lot. There's a lot of repetitive scenes where it's like, that doesn't need to be here. You could have streamlined this more. So I, I like, yes, there's a little bit of chunks in here, but the next highlight is Rudy Giuliani, which is something no one has ever said in their entire fucking life. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah, no, he finds out he's being investigated by Rudy Giuliani, and it's like clearly. I think that's the thing is you can tell this movie was clearly made in two thousand and seven because it's wait. like this big wink at the camera of wink, wink. Don't you know who Rudy Giuliani is? <laughs> right, and that's the other thing about this movie is this movie is a little bit like Sorkin politically with the West Wing. Use the West Wing to be like, hey, the war on terror is kind of fucking stupid, but I'm doing it in the most digestible way where I won't get canceled. And in this movie, he does that again, where he kind of mm -hmm. is like, he's basically like, without ever even mentioning it, taking the flashpoints, the people you know, and the important players and the ideas, and like basically being like, this is how we got here. But also, like, isn't it stupid that we're here? It's kind of like the subtext of the movie, which like, I feel like, is a little it, it doesn't quite work as effectively especially now where it's like on, on the end of the history where we're sitting at where we're like yeah that was kind of fucking pointless and dumb 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of weird to go back and watch media from this time and see people kind of tiptoeing around that idea because it's too ahead of its time. I mean, the I Dixie guess. Chicks basically killed their career because they were critical of the Iraq. I mean, Mike, Michael Moore, the documentarian, is like booed at the Oscars, like you said, yeah. for bowling for Columbine. So it's like... Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like, it's kind of weird to go back and watch this and then also see the, like, basically the most explicit dig they ever take is like Rudy Giuliani in 2007. You're like, this is, this is all right, whatever. At this point, we do get the reveal of, well, Wilson, uh, talks to one of his age because we do get kind of a nice scene where we kind of see what Charlie Wilson is about. And we do get a, a fun scene where he's dealing with one of his constituents who's like, they won't let us put the baby Jesus in the town square or something. And that's kind of a fun moment. That is funny. But then we get uh, a great character introduction to the lifeblood of this movie. The, person the MVP, who, and, undoubtedly, of this yeah. movie. The person who, every time he's not on screen, the movie goes down. Philip Seymour Hoffman as Gust. Like, he's fantastic. When he walks in, like, fun fact, his Oscar clip is his introduction, which is completely yeah. valid. He comes in here and he's just, his anger, his rage is so fun. No one does mad like Philip Seymour Hoffman does. It's like, it's blinding. I'm smarter and better than you, fuck you, rage. And having Hoffman get to have that power on a screenplay written by Aaron Sorkin is brilliant. And it's also one of those, one of the really, especially at this point, one of the first times where he gets to have that and he really does have the upper hand. Because, like, you look at things before this where he does get that rage, but usually he's kind of... You know, he, he's a little bit of John Cazale flailing in the chair in The Godfather Part 2. Like, he's usually, like in Punch Drunk Love, he gets that big rage moment, but he's a scummy mattress salesman, and you're kind of looking down on him as much as you are enjoying the rage. Whereas in this, he is just completely getting the upper hand on John Slattery, and it's great. Which, speaking of which, John Slattery at this point, uh, just about the beginning, all, I either just at the start of Mad Men or on the brink of doing Mad Men, is like, who is, he's great on that show. So mm -hmm. I, I love John Slattery. Also, you know, Howard Stark, shots out. Uh, but, you know, he doesn't get to do much. Uh, but I think John Slattery is pretty good. It's, it's like a yeah, fun little. He doesn't get much. He doesn't get to do it, but it's, it's always fun seeing John Slattery and stuff for That's me. Right. Like, oh, I love John Slattery. You get to work. Yeah. Um, but no, I just love. Philip's PSH breaking the glass again. It's, it's just so such good. a fun character introduction. Yeah, he's he is the lifeblood of this movie, and he's probably the reason why, even though I don't love this movie, why I like it as much as I do, because I think he is just so good. Right, and then we kind of get into the bulk of this movie, which maybe my big issue with this movie is that I just don't find any of this sort of stuff as interesting as it could be. Where it's, like, the ideas of, like, we are finding specific, like, military equipment and coming up with a new military strategy to, like, fix that guy. I just, that part doesn't grip me the way that, like, the, ins literally, pun intended, the inside baseball money ball or the inside tech of Steve Jobs or social network. Like, the inside, the inner workings of stuff is something Sork is really good at. Like, the inner workings of the military and a few good men with, like, oper legal operation or American president where it's, like, the in inside baseball of the White House. But this is the one time where the inside baseball of this doesn't hit for me and i think that's either because he doesn't take the time to explain it well enough or because he doesn't like make it as interesting as the maybe it's just not as interesting in general to cover i i'm gonna m make a statement here and you can tell me i'm wrong in terms of the west wing i think the least interesting elements of the west wing are typically the situation room stuff i With use some with some major yeah. exceptions, yes. Yes, there there are, of course, exceptions. But I think, on average, if I had to say, on average, what is the least interesting element of the West Wing, it is undoubtedly the Situation Room. It's, it's, it's any time he goes to the Situation Room for any sort of foreign policy military issue. Whenever it's, uh, whenever it's specifically that, and it doesn't result in a the proportional response monologue or anything like that, where he doesn't get a big dramatic moment out of it. And it's just used to like sort of 
exposition dump a certain situation for a certain episode, then yes, that's usually where it falls apart. And that's the issue to me is this feels like one underwritten exposition dump. And well, that's the thing that I'm questioning is, is that stuff just not interesting to us or could he have done it better? Is the I feel like this. I feel like the answer is you. I feel like for his first one back, and Tom Hanks producing. I think Tom Hanks wanted it to be very true to the book. And what Sorkin's really good at is taking the source material and making a really good story out of it, regardless of it being one hundred percent the truth or a or a close enough dramatic version of the truth that gets the essence of what they're going for right. It's like basically this doesn't do what we talked about just the other week with Air. We're like, Air is not a one-to-one -one perfect dramatic representation, and Affleck admits that up top, but it captures the essence of what that feeling is. And I feel like Charlie Wilson's would be better if it wasn't so caught up in the like in the beat for beat, getting it right to Charlie Wilson's experience story, and going more for this is the essence of what Charlie Wilson was trying to do and who he is and what we're going for. And I feel like it doesn't quite give me enough in that department for it to work. Where it like I I like I like. To me, this is the closest Sorkin gets to a McKay style thing, but he never goes into McKay territory where it's like, this feels like the story Adam McKay would do, but Adam McKay would then go ahead and take a sledgehammer and beat the point into you 20,000 times over. But if, Sorkin, Adam McKay, if Adam McKay directed this movie, there would have been like a montage at the end of this movie of 9-11 footage. Yes, it would, and, like, and that's why I get like, footage and all that. Like, like thank, like thank God Adam McKay didn't make this movie because I would hate it more. But also, well, like I, I think my, but that's sort of my issue is like I don't know who can, I think he's the guy to do it, but I just think he was too safe. This is a movie that screams I'm sort of playing too safe, and maybe that's necessary for him to make the next five movies he does. But like I, I think this movie is. A very much a low tier effort from him because he's staying too true to the source material. We we also haven't talked about him yet, and I'm curious where does Mike Nichols play in all of this? Here's my question: as someone who hasn't experienced a lot of Mike Nichols as a director on the whole, but I've hit a lot, a couple of the highlights. Mike Nichols, at least at with the stuff I've seen early from him, has an energy in those movies that is gone here. Whatever energy he has in The Graduate and and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and that like again those are his first two so it's or like early two so it's like there's not much like you can't really compare someone when they're young and vibrant to the end of their career but like I don't know if he lost something along the way movie to movie or if it's just this one but like I wonder what happened in the decades after The Graduate where this guy who has such a bite and such a like ability to layer subtext under context and the way to make everything have a point and a meaning and make you understand it and make you read deeper into the framing of scenes. To me, this feels like a very surface level story where he doesn't take the time. Like this is a movie where on paper, if it were the graduate Mike Nichols paired with a few good men, Aaron Sorkin would be a home fucking run where you have a guy who's just hungry writing the script and a guy who's hungry directing it. And what it feels like is you have a guy who's a little scared because he lost a lot of he's lost a lot in the 12 years and wants a win. And a guy who's at the end of his career, who's lost a lot of edge in those teeth, making something that if they had made it in 1991, I feel like it's a much better movie sort of thing. You see, I don't know, because as someone who is who has watched a lot of Mike Nichols movies, I think this is a guy whose movies are about as good as the scripts. Like he he can pretty much only add maybe a half star at best to his films. And usually, even then, sometimes it's just about right there. I think he's a guy who, he's he's he comes from theater. He's a very actor's director. He will direct the actors. And that's why so many of his movies have such great performances. I don't think he's a very technical director. I think he kind of just lets the tech people do what they want to do. I think he's I clearly more of an actor's director. And I guess that's fair, but my, my thing, like, I guess it's it's hard, to, it's not necessarily fair for me to compare his, like, his, like, the movie everyone associates it to, to an end of his career movie. But again, like, The Graduate has a lot of subtext and things unspoken 
that are conveyed to you through actors' performances and through the way things are framed. And I do think that's Nichols. I absolutely do think that's Nichols as a director, and he positions things that way, and that's why The Graduate rules. But, like, I wonder if there's just something that happened in his in his career or personal life or something where he just lost whatever edge he had in the six, late 60s. Because I just feel like, sure, I think you're right. And I think that's I mean, you're also, right. like, again, you're ignoring, like, Catch-22, which is a very mid-movie that he made sure. a movie after those two. Like, sure. I, I think you're you're overestimating Nichols based on those first two movies. A I guess. I guess. And maybe it is. Again, The Graduate could be very much Buck Henry's baby, and he's the real reason why it works or something. But, like, just from what I've seen, I feel like there's a better director in him than what he does here. And I feel like Sorkin yeah. and his script is a better writer than what he does here. And I feel like both – this feels – at least to me, from what I know, this feels very phoned in from both of them. And this feels like a passion project of Tom Hanks's. That's what it feels like. Is it feels like Tom Hanks really cares about this and no one else does. That's valid. Except maybe, except maybe, maybe PSH, but that's about it. But you never I mean, it. I think PSH really likes playing this character and right. was built for this character. Right. So I Again, think, I, I, I also just. He necessarily cares about the actual movie. I think he is killing it as this character. But also. Yeah. Actually, I don't even know if I believe that. Because you look at a movie like a Long Cane Pong, which is a garbage script and a very mid-level character where he's he's playing the schlubby rom-com friend. That is PSH's yeah. role in it. And he squeezes every ounce of comedy out of that script, and he's not even really a comedy guy. He yeah. is the only reason to watch that movie. He is hilarious. I in that I movie. really think that PSH just never phones it in. I just that's that's that really is true. I think well, he's I think he never phones it in. Actors of all time, right? And that's that's sort of my thing where it's like I I while I think Adams is not remarkable, I also just don't think she's like great in it. And like that's the thing is like most of the people in it, I just don't think are as interested in this as Tom Hanks clearly is. And I think that's the problem with this movie is like this. If we're being one hundred percent honest. This movie probably should have been written, directed, produced, and starring Tom Hanks. It should have just been Tom Hanks gets money and makes the movie he wants to make entirely on his own. Because I, I don't think Sorkin, I don't think Sorkin or Nichols care about this the way he does. And I honestly think it probably would have been a better movie. Yeah. I think I think if he's in control of every facet of this, if he's in control of the money, of the tech, the crew, and the script, and his and his own performance and the performances in general. I think Tom Hanks is able to get the thing he wants this to be. Um, I don't know if I, maybe PSH is still great because PSH never is bad. I don't know if PSH gets nominated if Hanks directs, but you know who knows. But like, I mean, I, probably I, doesn't I think, because if Hanks, especially if Hanks writes, there's probably not as much swearing. I mean, that's true. But yeah, I just think I think Hanks is probably the better equipped. Like, I feel like this is a waste of Mike Nichols and a waste of Aaron Sorkin. I see. I like this movie a little bit more than you do, so I don't know if I'd say that because there's still enough great scenes that it's like I don't think this movie is a waste. I, would, I think it I could have been better. And I will say, in the Mike Nichols realm, Primary Colors is a movie that he made ten years before this that deals with a lot of the sure. same vibes that I do think is better. So, sure. and I, I also, again, I also that's think that has, name, that's a very good script. So again, that I, has a lot. That has a lot to do. I think again, that has a lot to do with the source material. Of Primary Colors is insanely good, and Elaine May is, is insanely talented. And like Mike Nichols is sort of coast. That's a home run, no matter who makes it. But I think Mike Nichols just is the guy that gets to run with the ball on that one. But well, like, and good, good friends with Elaine May. So that true. was a case. So it's. it's yeah, but it's like I think it's a case where anyone probably could have subbed in on primary colors and it would probably still be just as good because that script is really, really good. I do um, want to talk about another great scene though. And and PSH, and Gus just gets all the best scenes in this movie. He does. I love the bugging of the scotch bottle. It's such a great moment because we get, you know, the Gus comes in with the scotch bottle and he's asked to leave like every minute or so like wilson and gus start talking and then wilson's aides come in and they start talking about all these things and they come out it's like you're under investigation by giuliani and they come back in and all these things and then gus like you should depose the limo driver it's 
It's like, were you listening at the door? It's like, no, I bugged your scotch bottle. Don't worry about it. And like, that is such a brilliant scene because we're getting all the Giuliani information and everything about what's going on. But it's a naturally funny thing before we even know that the scotch bottle is bugged because Gus just keeps getting asked to leave the room and come back. And then we get the button of, I bugged your scotch bottle. And that kind of shows like just how like actually of a good good at his job gust is because we've seen him be angry but we don't actually know how good at his job he is and it's like okay this is the guy that's and i think that's that's a brilliant scene and it seems like that but there are enough of i wish there were more but there are enough of that i don't think this movie is a complete waste and i'm glad it exists i just think it could have been better Sure. And to me, I think this is just a low tier effort from him that just doesn't hit for me. And at the end of the day, like I like it less and less the more I watch it. Um, and I think that's because I think this movie is infinitely better if we maybe clean up what we're like, make the point of what we're doing personal, make it a little more like in your face, essentially what we're doing, like make it clear what we're going for and make it clear what the objective is and how to do it. Like if you clean up what we're trying to do, make it personal to Tom Hanks, make it personal to everyone involved a little bit more efficiently and narratively. And then you can make it, I think that makes it more compelling. And the thing that Sorkin's so good at, especially in the West Wing, is when we do lobbying stuff. And that's why, like, I just wish there was more lobbying in this. I think if it's more about Tom Hanks lobbying for this, wheeling and dealing with the people more. I feel like there's not enough of that, and that's what this movie should be. I think that is valid, but you do get a little bit of that, and I actually do like the. And, and I, I think, I think the little bit that we get is probably the best stuff in the and movie. And like the Ned Beatty stuff, I think is fun. I like the Ned Beatty elements, and I like, I like that Ned Beatty's in this at all. Like, that's, yeah. that's my thing. It's like I, I like Ned Beatty in this, so it's like I mean, I, Ned Beatty's always pretty fun. He's I never, like. He's never, he's never really done bad. Um, that's not entirely true, but there. do you like him in Superman or do you hate him in Superman? I I actually kind of, I that's not what I was referencing. Okay, I was wondering if that's what you. I, I love him. Some, I love him in Superman. So. He has some really oof decisions later on in his, his career, sure. but yes, one of those no, oof I, decisions. One of those oof decisions was meeting one Casey Coho uh, in his home in North Minnesota. Wait, what? Casey Coho had a two and a half hour long conversation with Ned Beatty, uh, who is staying up here, who has a, who had RIP a house with his girlfriend up in like, I think 30 something miles North of East Grand Forks, Minnesota. Uh, he has a girlfriend who lives out here and they have a little house out, had a little house out here. And my dad brought a package. It didn't have Ned Beatty's name on it. It has his girlfriend's name on it. And Ned Beatty, Answered the door in a robe and brought my dad in, and they had a two and a half hour long conversation at Ned Beatty's girlfriend's house, and he like told me all about it. So that's like the coolest thing. That's the coolest story that's ever happened to my dad on the job. So that's so random, but I it love is, it. It's it's yeah. random as hell. But my my dad met Ned Beatty, and they had a two and a half hour. I love that he lived in a bathroom too. That's just that's awesome. That's the point part where I was like, oh yeah, okay. My my dad was like, yeah, he answered in the bathroom. It was weird as hell. So I was like, okay. But no, like, my, my dad loves Ned Beatty for that. So. I mean, Ned Beatty's awesome. You will atone. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, uh, so, yeah. We, there's a the performance we haven't talked about yet. I was about to say, I think we're on different, are we different sides of this? Because I, I don't know where I stand anymore. Because I used to think this performance was really, 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 really good. And I don't know why. I remember we actually got into an argument about this performance when you watched the movie. And you thought that this performance was good. I thought it was bad. And I still stand by that this performance is bad. This performance is really fucking bad, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts is actually really fucking awful in this movie. And I think the only reason she's in it is, like, Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts are, like, kind of friends and like each other. So, like, they're, like, he's, like, Julia Roberts, you get to be in this part. Maybe he was, like, again... It feels like a decision that would happen if Tom Hanks was directing the movie. He'd put Julia Roberts in the part. And it's weird that he got Mike Nichols to do that for him. Maybe because he was like, it's my money, so I want Julia Roberts in that part. But, like, it feels, again, like a Tom also, Hanks you have to remember, Julia Roberts at this time was still, like, one of the biggest superstars in the right. world. Right, she's, she's still doing the, like, Ocean's 13th this year. She's still riding the Ocean's High 
Like I mean, not just the OG. she's Julia Roberts. She is just yes. one of the hugest superstars in the world. Like she's sure. she's uber famous. I but I'm gonna make a statement. I think she's an incredibly overrated actress. She has been good a few times. She's been passable most of the time. She has never been great. Not in Aaron Brockovich. I was going to say, do you think she's Michael, great in Aaron Brockovich? Not in Pretty Woman. She has been good in all three of those. She has never been great. So you really don't. So let, 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 I want this on the record. Uh, Julie Roberts, deserving her of her Oscar win or no? Um, so I haven't seen. Um, uh, Requiem for a Dream. So I can't really. I can actually compare. To Remind like, me, I, I, is Kate Winslet nominated for Quills or no? I don't think she is. I haven't. I haven't seen Quills either. Okay. I can't. I don't think she. I don't think she is. But if she were, far and away, probably. Oh wait, that, that's, that's the year of the Contender, isn't it? Yes, Joan Allen, the Contender. Okay, yeah, no, Julia Roberts not deserving of her Oscar win. Joan Allen, I would give that Oscar, but I have Joan Allen, who is phenomenal. Allen. Joan Allen, phenomenal in the contender. Joan she Allen, also an actress that like Joan Allen is an actress who I've seen like I've seen three like of like I I've seen her in a lot I'm sure but the three where I took note and went Joan Allen really good are three times where I genuinely would nominate for an Oscar. That's the Crucible, uh, Pleasantville, and the Contender. Three no, times where she's the Crucible. What? I've never seen the Crucible. Honest to God, the Crucible, good movie. Uh, the nomination for the uh, supporting like she's deserving of her Oscar nomination, but the screenplay nomination is purely because he's Arthur Miller and probably doesn't have an Oscar nomination, so they give him an Oscar nomination well, because he's the only Arthur Oscar Miller. nomination. Because I think it's the only time he was eligible for an Oscar nomination. Right, and he's Arthur fucking Miller, and it's his most famous thing he's ever the not even famous, probably the best thing he's ever done is the Crucible. So it's just like he adapted it for the screen. Nominate Arthur Miller; it's the only shot we got. It's like. Which is probably exactly what happened, but like the Crucible, I don't know. The Crucible is interesting. I, it's a good movie. I should watch the Crucible. Man. So. I think Daniel Day Lewis is like shockingly not the MVP of that movie. Isn't Winona Ryder? Didn't she get nominated for that? No, she was not, but she's really good. Okay, Joan what? Allen's the only nomination for that movie, and she's very good. Why did I think Winona Ryder? No, she gets nominated for Age of Innocence and Little Woman. That's right. Yes, yes. Winona Ryder though in the Crucible. Fucking awesome. Like, unhinged performance. She's great. That's fair. I Well, now I really want to watch The Crucible. So yes, that's It's been a long time since I've seen The Crucible, but I really... Anyway, like let's get back on track. So let's let's, let's kind of wrap this one up. I think, yeah, I agree. Julia Roberts is actually really bad in this. Really bad. Um, uh, who else I, some of the, who like, the other... You know, you know who could have done this better? You know who could have done this exact role a million times better? Allison Janney. Would have been great. She's never wrong for any part ever. She's great. That's true. You can kind of just slot Allison Janney in any role and she'll adapt. At that point, though, do you put Allison Janney in there with Tom Hanks? I don't. I Maybe That's I'm true. wrong. Is Allison Janney like even close to the age of Tom Hanks? Here's the thing Allison Janney is, like I said, she's a chameleon. She can change her age to be whatever you need her age to be, especially in that time. True. And maybe like, she is that old and I'm just crazy. Where she seems like in her early 30s, and then Juno, where she seems like she's in her 50s. So, like, she she's a chameleon in terms of everything. So I think she's good. there's also probably a bunch of other people that I'd be like, yeah, you could pull this off. Yeah. Over Julie Roberts. Julia Roberts got cast because she's Julia Roberts, and that's why she got cast. And everyone thought that Julia Roberts was a great actress at the time. She's an incredibly overrated actress. I'm sure really is. And and yeah, you're right. Allison Janney is never wrong for any part. But yeah, so basically, that kind of like that's kind of the big things that happen. There's not much else really to touch on except maybe the ending, and the ending ties directly into the controversy. Because uh, I think the end of this movie ends. Um, where basically I think the whole reason this movie even gets somewhat of a war extension besides the people who are in it is the ending uh, where they're basically like uh, Charlie Wilson's like oh man I wonder what effect I'm going to have by doing what I did in Afghanistan and it's like a very like wink wink the whole thing's a bad idea and we're going to go to war in a couple of years and not well, let it no. well Wilson wanted to be able to finish what he did in Afghanistan and the government yeah. just pulled out of that. Like that's right. 
Anyway. Like, the, the movie doesn't put the blame on Wilson. No, 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 no. But it's it's definitely that, like, I, that's not what I mean. But I just mean, like, the ending of the movie is definitely Hank's or Wilson's perspective of being like, oh, no, I think I just fucked the Middle East. And now we're going to get, like, it's basically like, I wonder what's going to happen next. And it's very much like a, it's it, it feels like a bad attempt, not explicitly, but in as a, essence, the feeling that the end of the post gives me. Where the end of the post is like, Watergate, See, where this is the, exactly what's going down, and here's the next thing. And this just feels very much like a, oh no, 9 11 happened five well, years remember, ago. Do you remember the shot of the, where, the post? No, 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 no. In this movie, there was a shot that I was like, wait. And I had to rewind it because I was trying to figure out if it was intentional or not. I'm totally convinced it was intentional. Where, uh, when. Hanks I know exactly and, what, know. what? Yeah, yeah, no. I, Hanks I, and Hoffman yeah. are talking on like the balcony, and we pull out to the wide, and there's like two, you know, posts by the side of them, and it's clearly supposed to represent the two towers. Yeah, and it's like and not it's, since remember me, which actually came later, but still, like, not have we been jump scared by nine eleven since remember me. <laughs> Exactly. And yeah, and so that actually leads directly into all of the shit. Uh, so there was a happy ending filmed because Tom Hanks did not like the script's ending. And he gets the reward, uh, gets the award, uh, and um, like, okay, so the, so the happy ending sort of tank is not how the film, basically the one we got is not the end of the movie. So the or the original end of the Sorkin script. So Hanks does not like the original ending. He wants the award and leave it open. So that's sort of how they end it. Is is because of Hanks' thing. But the original ending uh, was one that ended on a scene that featured the nine eleven attacks being carried out. The original end of this film featured nine eleven being done, dramatized, and Hanks hated that and did not want that in his script. Uh, and Sorkin, like, was like, I really love it. And his original screenplay, which is different, uh, is been read by Matthew Alford, who wrote a book uh, called Real Power, Hollywood Cinema and American Supremacy, and said the film's original ending had the chance to produce what at least had the potential to be the Doctor Strange love of our generation, is how he describes the original ending of Charlie Wilson's War with the 9-11 attacks in it. So Tom Hanks basically goes, no, fuck that. I want a happy ending where he gets the award and we leave it open. But the original ending was 9-11 was going to happen. And it was going to be because they didn't finish and because Charlie Wilson's work was never finished. And that's the original ending. Um, but based on the ending we did get, the film comes out uh, just about Christmas time, 2007, uh, makes about 9 million opening weekend, number four at the box office, makes a total of 119 million worldwide, 67 67 million in the United States uh, off a budget of 75. So technically it does not make its money back in the United States. It barely makes its money back internationally. It's a bit of a box office failure. Um, the movie has like pretty positive reviews um, overall, but like um, this movie gets a lot of, it's very split down the middle from the government at this time. So Reagan era officials, including secretary of defense, Fred Eichel uh, said that it wrongly protests the notion that the CIA led the operation to fund Osama bin Laden and produce 9-11. Basically says this movie is a very inappropriate indictment of the U.S. government being responsible for their own 9-11. Other Reagan era officials like uh, the former policy analyst, Michael Johns, uh, who was a speechwriter for George H.W. Bush, said they got it, and got it entirely right, and it was the first mass appeal effort to reflect the most important lessons of America's Cold War victory that Reagan, that the Reagan-led effort to support freedom fighters resist, resisting Soviet oppression led successfully to the first major military defeat of the Soviet Union, sending the Red Army Pact from Afghanistan and the single most important contributing factor is one of those history's most profoundly positive and important developments. So, like, some of the Reagan pe people are like, you got it right. We saved the Middle East and we beat Russia. And other people are like, no, you blamed us for 9-11. Fuck you. And so it's, like, kind of a split down the middle. Um, in February 2008, the film was banned in Russia. Uh... They said it would not uh, appear because the point of view depicted the Soviet Union as being terrorists and bad guys. Uh, however, the UPI Russia head said that uh, they said that the film would just not make a profit. So we didn't want to release it. Uh, Russian bloggers said the film, like Russian bloggers said, the whole film shows Russians as brutal killers and it's not worth our time. Um, 
The film also shows uh, Wilson as immediately advocating to supply the Mujahideen, Mujahideen, I can't say that, Mujahideen, I think that's right, with the Stinger missiles. Um, they said that he and Wilson uh, were lukewarm on the idea of giving the missiles originally and that their opinion changed when they saw rebels were downing Soviet gunships with them. And basically when they saw the Soviets, uh, my roommate just gave me a huge jump scare, uh, that when the Soviets were um, being beat, that's when they decided to support uh, the Mujahideen. Um, so yeah. Sure. Uh, well, uh, this has been Charlie Wilson's War. He walked in here to correct me on my pronunciation, the Mujahideen. Uh, he's enough. in the Air Force. So. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Ryan answered everybody. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Hi, Ryan. Charlie Wilson's War. Charlie Wilson's War. It's fine. I th Here's my hot take. I think Malice is a worse made movie than this movie. Genuinely, the worst movie Sorkin's name is on in terms of how it's made. But if you ask me this time, which one would I rather go back and watch again? I would probably rather watch Malice again than this. Because every time I watch this, I like it less. And Malice, I know my opinion won't change. Malice will be the exact same for me every time. I think it's not great. Alec Baldwin has at least... I think the introduction of Philip Seymour Hoffman versus Alec Baldwin's God Complex scene, I think the God Complex is better. Um, I think that the God Complex monologue is better is the best thing between the two movies. have a combined. better overall movie, though, than Malice. I don't, don't think it. I don't think it's that much better. You have a catch bottle bugging scene. Like you have Philip Seymour Hoffman's entire performance. Like I think that is a crazy, insane. I take. don't think. I don't think Hoffman that is such a cokehead take. You should be Here's arrested thing. with Aaron Sorkin. I don't think. I don't think Philip Seymour Hoffman is doing enough to save this movie. I don't think that he saves it for being like a one star to a two and a half. That's oh, that's ridiculous. Like, this, I think this movie is. Yeah, this, this movie. Is, this movie, oh, this movie is. This movie's no, it's not a good movie. This movie's a bad movie, but I think this movie is toothless, boring, pointless, chock full of awful performances. Has one or two good performances at Philip Seymour Hoffman, who is carrying the team. It is Sorkin's worst script. It is worse than the work he does on Malice because the work he does on Malice is better than the work on this. The work that you can tell in Malice that is his is better than everything he wrote for this. So that's what I'm saying. I would rather watch Malice, which I think is a better written product from Sorkin's end than an entire film like this, where you can tell Sorkin is writing within a box and trying to stay within it. Whereas in Malice, they were like, here's your box, here's Scott Frank's box, and we're going to put them together and try and make a new thing. At least his part of that is kind of good. His part, everything he does in this is not good. I think there's enough great stuff here that it stays. I don't think there's a single great thing. I don't think there's a single great thing. The Scotch scene, PSH's introduction, PH. I don't think those are great. I think those are good. I let you talk for your Fine, thing. You didn't yeah. let, let me give my final thoughts. Gosh dang it. Man, you know, you you and Cody say, oh, Boatman interrupts all the time. You guys interrupt just as much as I do. You just gas. To be fair, I also, to be fair, I have a lot of lag in the new place. So I'm on a bit of a delay from you. Fair. Valid. I I also have lag, like, but anyway. Anyway. Make your um, final thought, Karen, all right? Make your final thought. Anyway. Uh, I was trying to make my final thoughts, and you weren't letting me. Anyway. Uh, I, think, I think that there's enough great stuff in this movie uh, that it covers up the stuff that doesn't work that I at least like it. Because there's enough stuff that I think is really, really, really good. That is great. The Scotch Bottle scene, the introduction PSH, PSH's whole performance is such a lifeblood to this movie. I think, and the stuff like that doesn't work outside of Roberts, I don't hate it, I just kind of find it meh. So, yeah, I think this is good. It could have been great. So, one last thing I want to point out about this movie before we, we get out of here. Is I do want to bring up the awards. For this movie, because this is the first time where Sorkin's movie is a, like, it's the first time since A Few Good Men, I should say, that he has a serious awards contender again. Because the American president doesn't really play at the awards. It gets a score nomination. That's about it. Uh, and Malice, obviously, was never going to be an awards contender. And A Few Good Men is the only time that Sorkin showed up at the awards. So, at the Academy Awards, the film gets a lone nomination for Philip Seymour Hoffman, the Best Supporting Actor, who is also the lone nomination for The Baptist, um, because, as, as he should be. But what I think is weird is the Golden Globes loved Charlie Wilson's War. Loved it. Charlie Wilson's War at the Golden Globes is nominated for Best Screenplay for Aaron Sorkin, who, fun fact, has been nominated 
for literally everything he's ever written at the Golden Globes, except for Malice. Everything he's ever written, they have, the Golden Globes have been like, Sorkin, nominated him, best screenplay. Uh, so he's nominated for writing. Best Supporting Actor in a Motion Picture, Philip Seymour Hoffman. And Best Supporting Actress in a Motion Picture, Julia Roberts, is nominated for a Golden Globe for her performance. Additionally, Best Actor, Tom Hanks. And Best Picture, Musical or Comedy, Charlie Wilson's War. I want to take a quick pause and say this film was nominated in the comedy category for Tom Hanks and for a movie. And I want to know, where did we laugh? Outside of, like, a couple times with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Where were the jokes in Charlie Wilson's War? Who made this decision? In the same way that, you know, how the Emmys will nominate shows in drama if they're an hour and comedy if they're a half hour. Sure. The Golden Globes, if the movie is colorful... It goes into comedy or musical, and if a movie is gray toned, it goes into drama. So, can I take one final, one final pause to just wrap up this Golden Globes bit and point yeah. out all the things that beat it? Because this is a bad year at the Golden Globes, like a really awful year at the Golden Globes. The best screenplay motion picture award is one of the only things they get right, where the Coens win for No Country for Old Men, beating Sorkin. <laughs> I want to point out the Coens don't win director, by the way. Julian Schnabel does for The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Uh, Julia Roberts correctly losing to Kate Blanchett for I'm Not There and Hoffman to Huff Bardem for No Country for Old Men. Tom Hanks loses in a category that includes Philip Seymour Hoffman for The Savages, John C. Riley for Walk Hard, and Ryan Gosling for Lars and the Real Girl. Loses to Johnny Depp for Sweeney Todd. <laughs> Who, like, yeah, nominated for an Oscar, but holy fuck, is that a bad performance? And I then. I don't think it's a bad performance. You guys need to chill. He's a bad. He you can't sing. Theater, he people. can't sing. He did. Johnny Depp can't sing. He can't sing. He uh, can and then sing fine. You're just. Oh, the pitch isn't right. It just doesn't sound. He can't sing. No, he can't he's sing. He's the C note so, here, and he's not so, hitting the C note. You're, you're a C note. Uh, Charlie Wilson's. I'm <laughs> fifty dollars. Exactly. Charlie Wilson's War. for me. I'll sell myself on eBay. Jesus. <laughs> so Charlie Wilson's War loses Best Picture Musical Comedy to Sweeney Todd and is up against Across the Universe, Hairspray, and Juno. Juno lost to Sweeney Todd. Juno lost to Sweeney Todd. What world do we live in? Also, it's one of the rare years in drama where they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven movies nominated for Best Picture Drama at the Golden Globes. Uh, it went to Atonement over American Gangster, Eastern Promises, Michael Clayton, There Will Be Blood, No Country for Old Men, and The Great Debaters. That's random. It's a random year at the Golden Globes. Anyway, that's the that's the that's the show. <laughs> anyway, next- John, John Travolta nominated for Hairspray for Best Supporting. We're gonna hop off here. We won't talk about this one because I think everybody knows what we're talking about next week. Social oh, yeah. network this is gonna be a big one. Actually, I don't think this is gonna be next week. This is just. The next video. So just you're gonna get two off. episodes this week because we, we we messed up last week and took a small break. So yeah, you get two episodes. So you get so just click on to the next thing. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.